So I think I'll go ahead and get started. Um, thank you everybody for joining us today. You all have done lots of Zoom calls because I see everybody is already on mute. So thank you very much for doing that. Um, I, my name is Laura Wills and I'm the Associate Director of Alumni Relations. And thank you so much for taking the time to join us today from all over the world. If you're just tuning in, we have someone joining us from Germany, which I just think is so exciting. Um, feel free to direct questions to me through the chat box and we'll get to as many of them during the call. If it's pertinent to um, what Heather's talking about at the moment, I'll stop her and, and ask the question then. Otherwise, we'll leave questions to the end, but please feel free to use that chat functionality. And now I'm happy to turn it over to Heather Flaherty from the Trout Gallery. Heather. Hello, welcome everyone. Um, so it's been really exciting to see some familiar names, um, definitely a lot of new names. Um, I'm excited to have everyone here. I do encourage you to use the chat box for questions. Um, I know I hate listening to just a lecture. I like a little bit more of a conversation. So don't be shy. Um, I'm happy to talk about things as we go. Um, and I'm actually really interested in your perspectives. Um, this is material that was fairly new for me. Um, and I always find that when I'm talking to alums, they have all kinds of experiences and expertise that sort of help us understand objects in new and interesting ways. Um, for those of you that don't know me, um, I just thought I'd say a few things about myself. Um, I am what is called the curator of education at the Trout Gallery. Um, and that is basically a fancy way of saying, I do everything that has to do with teaching and interpreting our exhibitions. Um, so that's a picture of me in the gallery with a group of college students. Um, that was an East Asian studies class who was learning about Buddhism. Um, so I do a lot of work with college students and faculty developing curricula. Um, I, we have 20 interns that are paid, we call them Trout Assistants, that work for us every semester. Um, they do everything from technology, developing apps, um, WordPress sites, to um, we have a big number of foreign language assistants that actually teach foreign language using works of art. These aren't just tours in the foreign language. Um, that's a sort of pedagogical approach we've developed and are known for at the Trout Gallery. Um, and then I also work with K through 12 in the community and the larger community partnerships across Carlisle and in the Cumberland area. So um, I do a lot of different things and that's what I love about my job. Um, I'm from California originally, so Pennsylvania is new to me. Um, I went to a school a lot like Dickinson. Um, I went to Grinnell College, which is also a small liberal arts college um, located in the Midwest. So I get the small liberal arts experience and I value it and I treasure it. Um, I did my PhD at the University of Michigan, um, which made me appreciate a small liberal arts college even more, <laughs> I'm attending a giant research university. Um, I, was very early to the art museum education game. I was an intern at the Cloisters Museum in New York City as an undergraduate. And when I graduated from college, I was offered a permanent position in their education department. So I spent two years in New York teaching. And then when I went to graduate school, um, I actually wrote my dissertation in New York when I was done. Um, and I spent my time half my time teaching at the Met, at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And there I really fell in love with being a generalist, loving to teach art from every time period, every decade, getting to make those virtual journeys around the world, which is something that we're gonna be doing today. Um, I've also been an art history professor. Um, I taught at Stony Brook University, Gettysburg College, and York College. Um, that also taught me that my calling and my favorite thing to do was museum education. And so um, in July of 2014, I joined the Trout Gallery as their curator of education. Um, my primary audiences I work with are faculty and students, K through 12 in the area, and then the larger community. And these are some shots. A few things I wanna point out is the image on the right is um, being taught in our Mumper Stewart Education Center. We are extremely lucky to be a small museum with a large 
um, dedicated space for hands-on learning. Um, so we can bring objects into this space out of our vaults to teach people. We can run programs for children. Our interns um, do a lot of their research and work in this space. Um, it's been a wonderful addition. Um, and that's all thanks to um, Mary Smith, um, who's a very generous donor to the Trout Gallery. Um, the other two spaces I work in at the top, that's the gallery itself. Um, when we had an exhibition of Impressionist works. And then the image on the bottom is from our print study room, which is a small room we have right off the two-dimensional vault that allows us to work with small groups of seminar students so that they can study works directly. Now, today's session was inspired by the art detectives. And I confess here that um, it's, it, this is a little bit of my way of showing my little sister that what I do isn't completely boring. She loves the art detectives. And she said to me, why don't you do stuff as neat as they do? And I said, I do. You just don't hear about it. But I have these detective journeys all the time. Um, and so, and her thing was that the social historian, the woman, Emma, who's part of this team, if you haven't seen this series, you can watch it on Amazon Prime. It's also on Acorn. Um, but they essentially find a work of art that's been in a vault somewhere and hasn't been looked at for years and years. They pull it out and they trace its history. And, you know, I think 90% of the time it ends up being a lost masterpiece of some kind. Um, but this Emma, the social historian, um, her work is not one that's just done by social historians. Um, art historians all the time have to do the work of social history in order to really understand works of art. And so today we're going to kind of step on the heels of art history detectives all over the place and we're going to see what that's like. So our story of one of my detective journeys um, begins with a request I had um, in 2018 um, from a visiting Islamic art historian at Dickinson. And she asked, can I bring my classes? to the Trout Gallery, do you have anything Islamic? Now, we have not had um, an Islamic art historian, and so no one had really asked me this question in the, the sort of four years I'd been at the Trout Gallery, so I went hunting in our collection, and sure enough, we had about 12, 13, if you were sort of loose with the definition of Islamic objects in our collection. These are some of the objects that I pulled when I was talking to her and thinking about what we would be looking at. And then I mentioned that we also had an Islamic miniature. Um, and the, the catalog information is what on it was just what you see here. Um, oil on silk, late 19th, early 20th century, um, that it was a gift of Mrs. Lloyd Gamble Cole. But that was sort of all I really knew. So before the class came, um, Professor Mickelson asked me if we could pull these objects out and just look at them. So she had an idea of what she was going to be teaching with. And I said, sure. Um, so we pulled all these objects out and I set them all around and she looked at everything and she gave me some information about each object that we didn't have. And that was pretty exciting. And then she got to this object and I said, isn't it a beautiful miniature? Now, I'm a medieval art historian by training, and I work on miniature paintings from medieval manuscripts. So miniature painting is kind of my thing. And so I was really interested and excited about this miniature. And so she looked at the, the miniature, um, and we sat there, and we were staring at it, and we were kind of trying to figure out who everybody was. She said, you know, Iconography, you know, sort of identifying specific figures isn't so much my thing. She worked more with um, different kinds of ceramics and glassware. Um, she said, I'm, I'm sure you could figure out exactly who each of these figures are. But Heather, I'm actually more interested in the cloth behind this miniature. And I was like, the cloth? And she said, don't you think it's really weird that this is in a triangle frame? And I said, well, yeah, it's so weird that our registrar has said a few times that he really wants to put that in a different frame because it's just hideous and so strange. And how are you going to hang that? And she said, Heather, I think it's in that frame for a reason. 
can you take off the back? Can you take it apart so we can see that cloth better and, and sort of take a look at that? Because I have a feeling that that's a very special cloth. And I was like, okay, sure. So um, I asked our registrar, Jamie, if he could do that for us. Um, and I should mention at this point that the thing she talked to me most about was the style of this miniature. Um, so she said the miniature itself is um, definitely Kajar um, and that you have a lot of art produced during this time period. She dated it to the late 19th century, um, but she said there's a lot of art produced in this sort of beautiful, heavily ornamental style during this period. And um, this, this is, this is when, when I think you should be looking at in terms of when the miniature is from. So we pulled the object out of its frame. And sure enough, when you did that, this cloth became much more visible. And it was very clear that in the background there was embroidered some beautiful call calligraphic script. Um, she said it was heavily ornamental. There wasn't enough of it to tell what it was part of. But she said, Heather, I think this is the Kiswa. And I said, the Kiswa. That has something to do with the Kaaba, right? Um, I, I was not fully versed. And she said, yes, and I have a friend who's a textile specialist, and I'm going to send her these photographs and let you know what she thinks. Meanwhile, can you go through your records and see if you have anything else about this object? Because that's really interesting if this is a piece of the Kiswa. So we did. Um, we pulled off the back, and we found this image taped to the back of the of the triangular frame as you can see it's a newspaper article in fairly poor condition it's a photograph from a newspaper and it has a large image of the kaaba and the text the caption below if you look at it in more detail um, is from possibly the exclusive news agency in london so it's it's a british newspaper which was sort of interesting to me. And it, it explains um, what the process is of Hajj. And um, what we can see clearly is, or House of God, I'm assuming it was Kaaba, or House of God, is the Holy of Holies of the Mohammedan faith. Muslims throughout the world prostrate, cut off, their daily prayers and perform a tawaf, or sevenfold cir circumambulation when they visit Mecca. And then I'm just gonna move my screen here a little cause it's in my way. In blank of the Kaaba, here shown in its black brocade covering is the small black stone most cherished treasure. So we have this newspaper article with a reference to the Kaaba and it also mentions this black brocade covering. All of these were sort of points in favor that of this actually being a chunk of the Kiswa. And as you can see um, in the image to the right, the area here, this raised um, circular area where pilgrims could stand, um, you know, we still have a, a section of that today at the Kaaba. So there's some continuity and you can kind of see that this newspaper clipping is, is certainly referring to this object in this particular place. So then I headed into our donor records because while we didn't have anything in the exact file on this object, that didn't mean that we didn't have a donor record that had been kept when the object was brought into the collection. And so um, I found this letter and the letter is from the donor, uh, Mrs. Cole, and I've blown it up here so you can see what she writes. This was April 11th, 1966. To most people, the Persian miniature painting framed in the triangle will attract interest. But the most historic and unique part is the background of black cloth. That was given me by an English friend who, for political reasons, turned Muslim a la Lawrence of Arabia. We will, we will, <laughs> I think she places herself squarely in, in a time period, um, but I love the visual. This cloth can only be possessed by high ranking Mohammedans who have made the pilgrimage to Mecca, as had my friend, the Hajj, who had the privilege of wearing the green turban. 
It was he who piloted, it was he who piloted the Malayan pilgrims by boat to Jeddah on the Red Sea and then to Mecca. I think a note of this should accompany any exhibition of that picture, that it is a piece of the covering of the Kaaba. So sure enough, right under our noses, in our records, we had this letter from um, Mrs. Cole explaining that indeed this was the covering of the Kaaba known as the Kiswa. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes when we're doing art history detective work, we get so fascinated with some of the clues we find that we get sort of momentarily derailed off of what we're looking for. And that's kind of the most fun part about what we do. And I couldn't help wonder, who is this Mrs. Cole who has these English friends that are, you know, are traveling, that they're taking by boat um, across the Red Sea, large numbers of pilgrims. Um, who is this woman? And so I did a little digging. And I found that in fact, we had a short biography of her that was written by a Dickinson faculty member, um, David Strand um, from the Asian department. And he had done an exhibition at the Trout Gallery um, a few years before. And a lot of the Asian objects that were in that exhibition were gifts of Mrs. Lloyd Campbell Cole. And so he had also wanted to find out a little bit about her. And so he dug through all the archives of the college college and pieced together a biography from all the letters she had written in the process of donating objects. And I, I pulled out some excerpts from the biography um, because I think her quotations are wonderful. And this is, it was particularly exciting to me because I feel like her intentions in donating these objects were being fulfilled in the sense that we were at present preparing a class for students. Um, we had a record number of Dickinson students enroll in this Islamic art class more than the college had anticipated. And it was very clear when I taught the class later that these were students from every major, completely interdisciplinary, but ones who were looking for more classes that could introduce them to Islamic cultures. And so, I thought this is this is really perfect. Um, and then uh, I'll mention that um, just this past year, we had another student who did an exhibition on religious objects who turned back to this particular um, miniature and the Kiswa and focused on it in more depth. But what um, what David Strand wrote was that Mrs. Cole's experience in Asia were clearly very positive ones. So it turns out she had traveled and spent an ex extensive amount of time in Asia. She looked on her collection as, quote, souvenirs of a happy past spent in China and Southeast Asia, end quote. In another letter, she writes, quote, while my husband was not with me during my long residence abroad, he shares my love for the old, the beautiful treasures of a kinder, friendlier world. And it is our hope that today's students may catch a glimpse of a less utilitarian era now passing away end quote. Um, and I, I just love the sentiment and her observations and the ways in which you could apply this almost to today as well. Um, Cole hoped that her donated objects would be part of a museum and intended that her collection, quote, should be at the disposal of students at any time, end quote. Um, and they are today. Any student can view objects in the Trout Gallery's permanent collection, um, request to see them in person, research them, use them in papers. Um, she expressed satisfaction that, quote, my treasures are among friends, end quote. So one of the things she was very clear about is she didn't want her collection of art objects auctioned off. Um, she wanted them to be put in the hands of other people who would appreciate them and love them, and she wanted them to be available to students. The home she shared with her husband in Blossburg, that's Blossburg, Pennsylvania. Um, both she and her husband were originally from Pennsylvania. Um, they didn't live there the whole lives. He was a doctor, actually, um, and she passed away in 1974. Um, so, uh, the home she shared with her husband in Blossburg was decorated with her collection of Asian paintings, sculpture, and furniture. She had, for instance, a dedicated China room that she would escort visitors into. 
Um, and she really and truly believed that studying Asia was important for Americans. She wrote, if the future of our country is toward Asia and its peoples, a better understanding of them might be desirable, end quote. And um, so I think you get a little bit of a sense of her personality, um, her values, and the kinds of object objectives she had for these objects when you, when you read these quotations. But I have to admit, I was still curious. What was this woman like? Who, who in the you know, 20s and 30s was heading off to Asia for months at a time and traveling? Her husband wasn't with her, so presumably um, she was doing this all on her own. Well, I myself did a little digging in the archives. And while I didn't find a lot of answers to the questions I started off with, I did find something that made me extremely happy. This is an image of Hazel Nay Jennings Cole. Um, so this is the photograph that we have in our collection of this illustrious donor. And I have to say, I, I have not seen every photograph we have of donors, um, but of the ones I've been, seen, this is by far the most glamorous. Um, so she is reclining on her, her divan. Um, I love the, the, the sort of Chinese panel paintings with the, the tree branch in the background, the bare rug um, that sits on the floor, um, her sort of satin slippers. The whole image is, is wonderful. Um, on the back of this photograph, is notes about its acquisition. Um, it was given by a dear friend of hers, Marion Halsey, it looks like, in 1969, um, for Dickinson College from a friend of Hazel Cole for over 50 years. Taken in her home in Worcester, Massachusetts, probably in the 1920s or early 1930s. Um, so that's where this object comes from. And most of the Trout Gallery collection is made up of donors, of donations. Um, so we have bought very little over the years. We don't have a large acquisition budget, but you wouldn't believe the incredibly generous people that have given us enough material to really be able to say we have an almost encyclopedic collection. There's definitely holes, um, but we can cover just about every century and, and country to some degree. Um, so that's Mrs. Cole. Um, I wanted to include, just for people who aren't terribly familiar with the Kaaba, um, an understanding of what this is. Um, this was a, actually a pre-Islamic monument um, and it was rededicated by Muhammad and that's when it became a, a focus for Islamic prayer um, and pilgrimage. Um, there's actually underneath this cloth a granite masonry and then it's covered with this silk curtain and calligraphy in gold and silver wrapped thread. That's the kiswa, that's this fabric that is placed over it. Um, you don't need to get into the, the nitty gritty, um, but as a medievalist, um, I first encountered this object when I was studying um, the history of ways in which um, pagan tombs and sites were transformed by Christians into Christian sites. And this was a great example of one that was um, made not only Christian, but then after that, it was it was a Muslim site. And so originally there were pagan idols stored here. The tradition holds that um, Abraham and his son, Ishmael, actually constructed the Kaaba. And of course, for those of you that are familiar with the relationships um, between um, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, it is through Ishmael that, um, that Muhammad traces his lineage, and that is the way in which all three of those traditions are, 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 are connected, is that they share the ancestry of important prophetic fathers. Um, so Jesus in the Islamic faith was a prophet in the same way that Muhammad is. Um, when Muhammad comes back to this site um, after he was kicked out, that's when he strips the Kaaba of idols. So he sort of takes away all the pagan influence and it becomes a site of, of primarily um, Islamic devotion, Muslim devotion. 
this is actually where, and some of you may have heard that there are no figures in Islamic art. There are people in Islamic art. It's an art of ornament or decoration. Um, there is a, a, a chapter of the Hadith, the sayings and doings of the prophet that specifically um, talk about this as the precedent for that, that he took away all these images, these faces of idols. Um, but one thing that's interesting is he actually leaves an image um, of Abraham in there. And that's because, of course, he's important to the Islamic tradition. Um, and as you see from the miniature we're looking at, um, it's certainly not the case that there are not figures anywhere in Islamic art. Um, particularly in the early days, there were lots. Um, and depending on where you are and what kinds of cultural influences are at play, there may very well be um, uh, images, Islamic images that feature humans. So Mrs. Cole's friend, the Englishman who wore the green turban and she describes as a sort of Lawrence of Arabia, he went on Hajj. Um, and this is an example of the Kaaba at the height of Hajj season. You get a sense of the thousands and thousands of people that visit. Um, and you can imagine the pilgrims that her English friend brought to this event. And the object, the, the, the actual fabric that's at the back is a piece of this cloth that covers the Kaaba called the Kiswa. And it just looks black to me. I always just thought of it as a black cloth, but when you look up close, it's actually an elaborately embroidered textile. And so one of my questions along the way was, who makes this? I mean, that's a, that's a big, big cloth. And if it's changed every year because her friend got it at the end of a Hajj season, and it's actually, I did some digging, it's changed every year at the end of the season and pieces of the fragment are given to important pilgrims. And so I became interested in what the Kiswa is. And it's really hard to describe and even to see in pictures. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you um, a little video that takes us into the factory where the Kiswa is made. So you have a sense of what this is like. Um, hopefully this will play nicely for you. Um, depending on your bandwidth, sometimes it cuts out a little bit. So I will be reading the text that narrates the video to hopefully give you some continuity in case that happens to you. And so, I have to share a different screen because that's how this all works. And I want to show you Google Chrome right here. We've all gotten rather quickly used to Zoom <laughs> in our new, our new COVID world. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and start this. So that's up close, so you can really see the embroidery. And this is the factory that is in Saudi Arabia, where these are made every year. And those are actual gold and silver that the fabric is embroidered with. And there is a very large team. And the sayings are verses of the Quran. So you... <laughs> Look at, so you've got 670 kilograms of black silk, 220 of gold and silver thread, and multiple people working at the same time. It's all sewn by hand, and about 200 people work together over eight months to make sure it's ready in time. Um, as you can see, pilgrims love to visit the Kiswa factory. Um, they take selfies in front of the Kiswa workers. And there's a, a ceremony that happens every year on the day of Arafat where it is the, the previous Kiswa is removed and the new one is put up. So this has actually been a practice for 4,000 years um, that the Kiswa has been covered with, uh, that the Kiswa has been in existence. Um, 
Um, so that gives you a, a little sense of what the process is like and what kind of fabric we found out we had when we started looking into this, this, this object that ended up to be fascinating and cool for so many different reasons. Um, the other part of Mrs. Cole's letter that I became interested in when I started looking at this was the, the fact that her English friend was allowed to wear the green turban um, because I had thought that, that, you, that you had to be a higher rank. Um, you couldn't just be a converted pilgrim because I was used to medieval manuscripts and wherein it is the prophet's descendants. And so the image on the right here gives you a sense of the kind of imagery I had been used to. Um, what I didn't know is that after a Muslim pilgrim makes the journey of the Hajj, at that point, he is allowed to wear the green turban. Um, and green, for those of you that don't know, was um, thought to be the favorite color of Muhammad. He wore a green turban and a green cloak. We find references to green throughout writings um, in both the Quran, but also the Hadith. Um, Paradise, for instance, is described as, um, of course, this beautiful garden-filled paradise, um, but the people there will be adorned with bracelets of gold and will wear green garments of fine silk and brocade, reclining therein on adorned couches. Um, so you can see how this, the green color comes up throughout. And of course, um, several nations, I just included Pakistan and Saudi Arabia here, indicate their adherence to the Muslim faith by flags that um, are green. Some nations use green not for these reasons, but these are examples of those of some that do. So then I got to wondering, okay, what is that journey? If you're going from Malaysia to Jeddah into Mecca, what are we talking about? Because in my head, I couldn't quite picture it. So I actually went to a travel agency website that specializes in trips to Mecca from Malaysia, just to kind of see if you wanted to do this today, what your options would be. Um, when I put in my itinerary, this is the, the route they gave me. Um, starting in Malaysia, I could, there was a driving route, which I thought was hilarious, but I could take a cab and then an, air, an airplane and then a bus was one option. And then I had to imagine this Englishman by boat taking a large number of pilgrims from Malaysia clear all the way to Mecca um, across the Red Sea. And so I started to have more of a sense of who this person was and what it must have been like for him. Um, I won't go into it here, but I also discovered that the relationship between um, the British government, um, and of course Malaysia was a colony, and the passage of pilgrims from Malaysia to Mecca is incredibly fraught. And the British made a lot of money out of controlling the travel um, permissions for people from Malaysia. Um, so it, it was a, a business venture and one that the British um, definitely profited out of over the years. So there's a whole history there that I started to sort of head down. I was like, no, 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 I, I need to get back to the object. I have to explain the object, but you could, you could look into this forever. So the question that Professor Mickelson wasn't quite as sure about is, was who everyone was in the miniature. And I said, that's fine, because that's iconography. I'm a medieval art historian. I study illuminated manuscripts. I love iconography. Um, and that's just sort of tracking down who, what are the conventional representations of objects and people throughout the history of art? And can you use those to determine what you're looking at? And so sure enough, um, there were plenty of other miniatures and larger paintings that were somewhat similar to, um, to the object that we had that allowed me to identify the main figures in, um, in the miniature. And so, um, you know, uh, Professor Mickelson was fairly sure that it was Ali um, and his two sons. We don't know which one is Hussein and which one is Hassan, but they're both seated below him. Um, he has a sword on his lap and that's a conventional representation of him. He is flanked by his two closest friends and, and um, the guys that were always hanging out with him. Kanbar, who was sort of his 
um, manservant. Some people, times he's called his doorkeeper or his groom, um, who was very devoted to him. And on the left is Salman i Farsi, who was a close companion of Muhammad and then followed Ali after Muhammad's death. Um, some of the objects, um, I was thinking about teaching this object with students, and you may remember from our early slide of er other objects we had, um, that we have a Quran stand in our collection. It's, it's from Africa, but given that we have the two sons seated with the Quran between them, sitting on a Quran stand, I thought that was a wonderful tie-in, so our students could kind of start to understand the, the physicality of some of the objects that are important within the Islamic artistic tradition. Um, and then, of course, we have these beautiful angels emerging from the sky in the top of the miniature. Um, just beautiful. And of course, I asked Professor Mickelson, well, can you translate the text for me? That is, and she laughed at me. She said, Heather, um, most often the epigraphy is so stylized that you couldn't read it even if you were conversant. Um, but it's, it's functions primarily as a mnemonic device. It's a trigger for prayer so that people, this is a devotional miniature. When people look at it, that, that text automatically brings up text from the Quran or the Bismillah, and it's a trigger for people who look at it to begin to pray. Um, there? Yeah. I have a question. Sure. Uh, why are their faces shown? This is very rare for Islam, actually for some interpretations against the Quran teaching. Yes, so I mentioned that earlier when we were talking about um, when we were talking about the Kaaba. Um, so one of the sources that's cited um, to suggest that Islam does not prohibit that does not allow um, imagery that features humans or animals is that specifically um, the, the practice in the hadith that Muhammad went into the Kaaba and removed all the idols and representations of people. Um, what we find is that in practice, it is not nearly the case. Um, so commonly people hear that, they see Islamic art that is primarily aniconic and figural, and they assume that it's that way everywhere. Um, it wasn't. And not only that, it didn't develop as a common practice until um, years after the prophet died. So I studied um, a number of early, early objects um, from the ninth and 10th centuries. And you had um, passages from the Quran um, that were illustrated. You also had images of Islamic um, prophets and leaders interacting with biblical figures. Um, so what we find is that the so-called prohibition on um, imagery that is of people is very local um, and it's very time period based. Um, so you do find examples, depending on what country you're in and what local and locality, of, of actual people being depicted. I hope that, any, any other questions about that? Nothing's come in about that. It's about 2.40. Okay, great. So we, uh, um, I just wanted to say that one of the things we struggle with our students is to kind of explain the, the complexity of Islam today. Um, who's a Sunni? Who's a Shia? Why? So this object then became really important because it focuses on Ali for us to talk about um, the sort of origins of the divide between Sunni and Shias. Um, because of course, um, for Shias, Ali is the rightful inheritor of the caliphate and for Sunnis not. And of course, um, the Sunnis are, are by far the larger percentage of Muslims. Um, but our object comes from Iran. Um, and as you can see here, the percentage of Shiites in Iran is 56 to 100 percent. So we would imagine that devotion to Ali would be common and would be higher than it would be in other areas. And then finally, I wanted to mention that um, today, this is an image of the Kaaba today, um, and the door is made of solid gold today. And that's, I love that image with the, the pilgrim's hands reaching towards the door and the kiswa falling forward. Um, and it is, of course, as we saw, made in Saudi Arabia today, it used to be made in Egypt and pilgrims would actually carry it as part of their caravan on the Hajj to bring it. Um, 
And of course, we see people um, from all over the world spending a whole lot of money um, to visit the Kaaba today, um, because of course, to do that once in your lifetime is one of the pillars of Islam, so it's crucially important. And I think about this in terms of the COVID-19 situation today, because we're not being allowed to visit um, the Kaaba this year and, and the way in which that will sort of have a long-term impact. And then finally, um, I want to say thank you to everyone um, for sort of following me on my detective journey, examining our um, Islamic devotional object. And I wanted to mention that if you are tired of quarantine and you're sick of being in your houses, um, we launched Trout from Home um, about a month after we had to leave the gallery spaces and start working from home. And um, it is a site that's devoted to entertaining you from your living room with wonderful stories about art objects, conversations that are happening in our community related to art and COVID and what's happening on the ground. Um, and there are also links there to take a virtual tour of our exhibitions. And I should say that most of those tours were recorded by Dickinson College students. Um, so it's a great way to see the work that they've done as well. Um, the object that we studied today is up right now in the Trout Gallery. It's one of the objects in the Imagining the Divine exhibition that was curated by Dickinson student Abby Cottle, who just graduated. She's an archaeology and religion double major. And she curated that show because she really wanted to promote interfaith dialogue on Dickinson's campus. Um, the students on campus were were shocked that we were talking about religion in a way that I hadn't anticipated. Um, but they said, it's not something you can talk about with your friends. It's kind of a taboo subject. And Abby did a wonderful job bringing people across campus into really important conversations about religion and, and their own personal views and the ways in which it was crucial to their identity and their sense of who they were in the world. And so I think um, Mrs. Hazel, I think Hazel, originally Jennings, would be very pleased um, with the legacy that she has left in terms of the way in which um, students have, have continued to work with her objects. And several of her objects were actually in that exhibition. So thank you. Yeah, I and I love, love questions. So if people okay. have questions. Is the embroidery the same every year or is it a new design? Oh, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, and I am not sure. I have to put that down on my list. Um, I had assumed that it was the same design, but I don't know. Does anybody else know? Sometimes our audience. <laughs> I don't see anything yet. Um, there is a question, will this webinar be available offline later? And the answer is yes. This will be on our Dickinson at Home web page within a few days to view later. So if you go to Dickinson and go to the alumni page on the left in the gray box, there is a Dickinson at Home web page where there's um, all sorts of resources and links to past webinars that you can view. So that will be on in a few days. Um, Lexi, you don't have a question. You're supposed to have a question. <laughs> Somebody has, answered the inquisitive. That, um, somebody has answered that most likely the broider, embroidery is the same. So okay. one person's guess. No questions right now, Heather. Okay. Lexi. <laughs> well, I, I will hang on here for a few minutes in case there's more questions. But I, Heather, I wanted to thank you so much for doing this for us. You're welcome. And I forgot to tell everyone that my background is the Trout Gallery. So even though you can't visit in person right now, um, you, can, you can imagine you're in, this is our upstairs gallery space. It's not the current show. This is a collection of photographs by Joyce Tennyson. That was an exhibition we did um, a couple of years ago, but it gives you a sense of, of actually visiting, even though you're in your living room. Well, again, Heather, thank you so much. I want to thank everybody for joining us. Um, I can say that I've watched a few of the Trout Galleries online auctions, and they are great. So I highly recommend them going to um, the Trout Gallery page and finding those online options. I watched one on how um, how art is wrapped and shipped. And yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, so Jamie, uh, Jamie Bowman is our, he's our, he, ran, he wears a lot of hats. He's our collection manager, our registrar, and our preparator, and he designs our exhibitions. Um, and I asked him if he would do Tales from the Vault, because I said, everybody's always asking questions about behind the scenes stuff and they like your stuff. And he said, but my stuff's so boring. I'm like unpacking crates and hanging art. And I said, yeah, people love that. They want to know about that. <laughs> and so um, he started his uh, he started his blog and he's by far the most popular person on our Trout From Home site. So I think the the blog entry you read about had like 416 viewers, um, which was better than anything the rest of us put together. So it really was very interesting. <laughs> um, so I see no more questions. So I want to thank everybody again. I hope everybody stays safe and hope to see you on our next webinar. Thank you. Thanks so much, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, Heather. You're welcome. Good to see you. Nice to see you, too. Bye. Bye.